chat, but we're like very on time this I time. I don't feel late. I don't feel uh, late. Nah, I feel I feel very on time. I am very on time today. Are we live? I think we're live. We're live. Hey everyone, I'm KK. I'm Kyle. And today we are going to take apart the iPhone 12 Pro Max. So we already took apart the iPhone 12, the iPhone 12 Pro, and all of my engineers are taking apart the iPhone 12 mini in the other room. So you're stuck with me and our CEO, Kyle. Hello. Uh, and uh, we haven't really decided who's going to be taking this phone apart. We just got the 12 Pro Max. We're excited to see inside our third iPhone <laughs> for the last two weeks. Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, we said we'd rock, paper, scissors. I'm pretty rusty at taking apart iPhones, but let's do it. Okay, you ready? All right, here we go. Wait, so which one? So I got rock. Uh, so you got I paper. won, uh, so let's keep going. So. Okay, so you won. I won, so I don't have to take it apart. Okay. I am going to take apart this phone. And so, I'm just going to mentally prepare for that for a yeah. second. <laughs> it, this, is, this is how we, you know, if, if you, if, uh, we were both ready. Yes. But I think, I think this yeah. is a good moment for you. Uh, so you guys have been wanting me to take apart the phone for a while anyway, so I think it's time. Um, what's the last time, what's, what's the first time you took something apart? So the first time I ever did a live teardown was with Kyle. And before I started working at iFixit, I never had any technical experience before, and he made me do my first teardown live on the Vergecast stage at CES. First teardown ever. And um, before I fix it, I'd never taken a phone apart, and I've probably only done a couple dozen battery swaps on actually nothing past an iPhone 8, so this will be new for me. We hire a lot of people with repair experience. KK yeah. just wasn't one of them. I just wasn't one of them, so uh, bear with me. But also, if I can learn how to do this, and do it live in front of lots of people, then you can too. So I yeah, need to so get started. Th this is kind of fun because you've got uh, you know a, a non-technical background. I'm a software person, but we're, we're gonna figure this out one way or another. So I did cheat a little bit. We did cheat a little bit. We had seen that the phone display is really hard to get off. So we took the heat gun and I didn't want either of us to suffer through lots of... We didn't want to make all of you have to wait through the process. So the, the new glass on, on the, the, all of the new 12s is the ceramic glass. Apple says it's the most drop resistant uh, iPhone ever. But the real thing, and I, if, could you show off before you before yeah. you do that, show off how flush it is. I was just getting really excited um, Or maybe to get you got the other one next to it. Show yeah, off, so we also picked one. up the mini, so you can look at those. Uh, so the key thing, if you hold it straight on, is you don't. The glass doesn't protrude beyond the aluminum bezel, and yeah. so if you think about it dropping, uh, most uh, impacts on glass are on the edges of the glass where it's most fragile. If you hit the face of glass of the glass, it's uh, it's going to be a lot more able to withstand that impact. So it's relatively rare that you have a phone that cracks from an impact straight on the glass. Usually, it's from dropping your phone and hitting the edge. So what Apple has done to improve the durability of this phone is recess the glass flush so the aluminum is completely flush with the glass so if you drop it on from any angle it's going to hit the aluminum before it hits the glass that's a that's a wonderful net win and it's definitely an improvement over uh the galaxy so i've got i've got here this is a s20 uh and this has the glass wrap all the way around the edge so the glass is the thing that's going to get hit and we see this with samsung phones that when yeah, you know, these OLEDs are fragile. You hit the glass and they're toast. Kyle, how many screens have you broken? I'm really antsy to get started now because now I know I'm doing this, so I'm just gonna dive right in. Uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, I um a few. <laughs> the last one. This is great. I was I was mountain biking. I had my my phone on the handlebar and I fell off a bridge and what? I went upside down and my phone actually broke my fall. <laughs> <laughs> it is the most damage I have ever. Like it wasn't like the glass was just shattered. The the screen was toast. Um, but it that was a that was a Motorola phone, and uh, I was able to throw a new screen on it. And Only Kyleen starts a story with, "I fell off my mountain bike, and it was great." <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, we have a lot of uh, wonderful mountain biking trails here on the central coast of California. All right, and so I am pulling off my first shield so I can get to disconnecting the battery uh, for safety first. Mr. Noob, ask us your question. We are, we are watching the chat. We want to hear from you. And I, I have disassembled here in front of me. I've got a iPhone 12 Pro and a 12. So we can take a look at, uh, at these parts as she starts to pull apart the 12 Pro Max. 
This is, I mean, it used to be we would get a new iPhone that would be an iPhone and we would take it apart and that would be it. And now there are so many different models um, that really the conversation here is about what is different in the 12 Pro Max from, uh, from the 12 Pro and the 12. So I am disconnecting connectors and trying not to be in the top down shot, which is a fun way to do repair when you are distant from, Taylor always talks about this when he does hands on live tear downs because it's really hard not to get your head in it all right battery is disconnected and i'm going to go for this it's important to disconnect the battery first so as we're using metal tools inside the device it's very easy to accidentally short something out common mistake that people make in repairs so the first thing we always say is disconnect the battery uh, and then keep it disconnected that's easy with the iphone with the ipads we have a common problem where the battery you disconnect it but it can very easily uh the cable flops back down and reconnects re-energizes the device and causes many, many iPad repair failures. Um, so it's essential to disconnect the battery, keep power off. Okay, we have a question. Uh, how old is I fix it? Uh, Wyatt, we uh, we started in 2003, so I guess that makes us close to 17 years old now. Oh, I was gonna say 16. Yeah, uh, we um, well, I, I, we started in, in the dorms at Cal Poly, just down the road from us here. And uh, our first ever repair manual that we wrote was for the PowerBook G3 Pismo which I still think is one of the best laptops that Apple has ever made. So if you really like connectors, and if you've watched this channel, I hate them, I break them often. Uh, this board is just chock full of connectors, so I'm going to be as delicate I can, as I can with the spudger and uh, gently remove them so I can get this display off and get moving. And so as you see inside the 12 Pro Max, the battery looks very different than on the others. This is the 12 battery, I think the 12 and the 12 Pro batteries are interchangeable. Uh, this battery, so this is a 2800 milliamp hour battery. What's the battery uh, capacity on that one? Okay, okay. Oh, I don't know. Um, do we know that yet? Oh, yeah. it says 3,687 milliamp hours. Yeah, so that's another uh, you know, 800 milliamp hours bigger. And, and that bigger battery size comes from the L shape on the left. So they filled up the extra space inside the phone with that L shaped battery. We first saw the L shaped battery in the iPhone 10. It's a really, really cool manufacturing process. I, I got to go through a lithium uh, battery factory in China, uh, and it's fun to see the process. It, it's almost kind of like a paper mill or like <laughs> it, with the way that they make newspapers because you have this film, and what this battery is is it's a whole lot of layers of film with the anode and the cathode uh, uh, coated on it, and then it's, it's folded back and forth, and then you've got the tabs along the edge that, to pull the power out. Oh, and I also wanted to mention that I recently got a cat. So one of the other reasons I don't do hands-on teardowns, as you can see, uh, I have scratches all over, which is pretty cute. So uh, I was hoping that our video team would flash my cat on the screen because I love him. His name <laughs> is Taika Waikiti. Uh, might be a Taika Waititi fan if you are. Haven't watched The Mandalorian yet this morning. And your kitty is very cute. It's a very cute cat. Very cute kitty. Very cute cat. But seems to be rather. He is my nickname scratchy. for him is Taika Y Killer because I, I kind of think he wants to kill me. Does he scratch anyone else? No, that's it's just me. Just you. I got really excited about that. And uh, you put up with it. I do. Yeah. He uh, he was the most effective thing to stop doom scrolling. So if you are able to get a cat, then maybe do that. All Good right. Pandemic. Displays, uh, <laughs> pandemic mental health. True. Management, yep. absolutely. Okay, so we got the display off. Anything different as you pulled the display off from the other devices? So, I mean, the first thing that I noticed is the Taptic engine is a different size. Um, I'm going to get it out so you can do some comparisons. Yeah. Here's the Taptic engine from the 12, and it's quite a bit smaller. And uh, in previous generations, everything was on the right, but now we have the logic board here on the left. The Let's go back to the Taptic engine. Yeah. Would you say, looking at that, that there might be room around that corner of the phone for an additional port, maybe a jack? Okay, Perhaps Kyle a is... a 3.5 millimeter jack? He is going to be It very... sure seems to me that it would fit just fine. <coughs> Kyle will never stop lamenting the headphone jack. I'm but... going to get Scotty over at Strange Parts to add a headphone jack. I, I will not buy an iPhone until they put a headphone jack back. Uh, personally, I'm a, I've switched to Android. I'm very happy with my Pixel. Uh, this is a this is a 3A, and I got my headphone jack there. It's fantastic. Wait, what's your I daily driver? I don't actually know. It's a Pixel 3A. Pixel 3A. I'm, the 4A is great great phone too. The 4A right now is uh, is Mike is uh, Google's fastest phone, uh, which is which is devastating for the Pixel 5. Uh, but you can get the fastest uh, Android phone, uh, or I don't know, not the fastest, the fastest Google phone uh, with a headphone jack. 
in the foray and it's, it's quite affordable. You can, <laughs> for the price of the iPhone 12 Pro Max, you can buy like four Pixel 3As. Because you would, <laughs> why would you want four? When's yeah. the last time you owned an iPhone? Uh, my last iPhone was the 6S, which had oh, a headphone I, jack. I ha that was that was the phone I like learned repair on. So yeah. that's the phone I had here. I fix it, and that one's near and dear to my heart. So let's talk about the Taptic engine a moment. This guy. Uh, so there's a, a vibrator inside. We have. Uh, if you go back to some of our, our past teardowns, you'll see we've X-rayed. Uh, the the vibrator in this is it, it's it's a very cool technology. But of course, the Taptic engine and, and all the all the magnets in the iPhone are rare earth magnets. Those rare earths uh, come from a mining process that is incredibly environmentally toxic. Ninety five percent of the world's rare earths come from China. Uh, the rare earths uh, in um, in this magnet originally uh, probably came from. Uh, the Baotou rare earth complex in Inner Mongolia, which is in northern China. It has been called one of the most toxic places on earth. Uh, Bloomberg described it as the dystopian uh, lake filled with the world's techno lust. Uh, it is an incredibly toxic process to mine and uh, manufacture rare earths. So Apple knows that this is a major problem, and they are sourcing recycled material to make the Taptic engines. They say all the Taptic engines are using recycled rare earths. That's cool. Uh, what they don't mention is that they are not recycled rare earths from iPhones. Uh, they found some industrial process somewhere that they're sourcing the rare earths from. Um, probably the, those rare earths that they're sourcing would have, got, would have gone into a landfill somewhere. So it's good that, that Apple is using recovered material in this. Uh, but don't be fooled by thinking that Apple is recycling iPhones and recovering the rare earths from it. Um, There's an article about that, right? Where it was like Apple's worth its weight in gold. Remember? Yes, we see reporting all the time where Apple will release a, a environmental report and they'll say, hey, yeah, we recovered 2,000 tons of gold uh, from electronics that we recycled last year. And so everyone says, Apple got 2,000 tons of gold from iPhones. No, that's not what happened. Apple is legally required under California law and uh, laws in a number of other states to collect or to, to buy recycling credits from recyclers. And so uh, recyclers will collect Dell computers, HP, old TVs. They collect all that together. Apple buys the recycling credits from them to tell the government, hey, we recycled this much product. Um, but when, when you hear Apple talking about how much gold they have recovered in recycling, that's not recycling their products or even Apple doing recycling with a fancy machine like Daisy. Uh, it's Apple doing what they were legally required to do. Um, uh, Apple's environment team is really good at saying one thing that lets you lead you down a path to believe they're they're doing something that you would think it would be rational for them to do without them actually doing it. So Kyle, there's definitely a this Taptic engine is a different size. It's a lot taller and sh this way. <laughs> Words are failing me. Uh, and usually we're used to seeing the long rectangular skinny ones. What do you think that will do for this phone? Does that that the Taptic engine is bigger? It's just a different size. It's a lot taller and... Well, you have a lot more mass that you need to move. So if you think about a vibrator, in order for it to have the same kind of feel in a bigger uh, device with, you know, substantially more mass, right? That phone is a lot heavier than, than the 12. But how does it feel compared to the Mini that you've got there? Uh, I Wait. gave the Mini oh, away. Oh, you handed the Mini off. I All did. Right. I handed it off. We're, mini is, is involved in tearing that. But, I mean, substantially heavier. So if you think about creating that vibration effect in a much larger phone... Uh, you have to move a larger amount of mass to have the same kind of sense of feel of the phone vibrating in your hand. So it would, I would imagine the Taptic engine is proportionally larger. I guess you could also shake, uh, shake it faster, but I have a feeling that they're already vibrating about as fast as they can. I'm just going to remove the SIM tray because we always forget. And... We've got a question. What are our favorite repairs? i got to say my favorite repairs, I'm, I, I do electronics so much at work that I get home and I don't want to work on electronics anymore. <laughs> Um, so my last repair was my tractor. Uh, I I uh, I just uh, I don't know if this is a repair. Last that, that... repair or ongoing repair? Because well, it's you're... an ongoing repair, absolutely. But the thing that I did on Sunday was uh, the the headlights uh, stopped working, and rather than replace or fix the aging headlights, I added a bling and new LED light bar to it, uh, so my my tractor can light up the neighborhood. All right, so I'm trying to get the Taptic engine out. Well, I'm trying to get the speaker out here, but it looks like there's a cable that is sandwiched around the Taptic engine, so I'm trying to free the Taptic engine, and there's lots of tiny screws. I'm probably not doing a great job of showing this off, but if you guys want to see anything closer, let me know, or I'll just keep going with this massacre. Abby wants a shout-out. Hey, Abby. Hey, Abby. I hear you're suave and handsome. Whoa. 
Yeah. That's it. I've never heard you say those words before. Here we are. Here we are. 2020. Anything can happen. So Jan wants to know, what does a two-part battery say about longevity? Great question. And I want to talk about batteries for a while because uh, I mentioned that it's this paper folding process to oh, make yeah, one of these batteries. Well, that works fine if it's square like this, but when you have a L-shaped battery uh, like the iPhone 10 has and like we've gotten the 12 Pro Max, uh, it's a very different folding process. And so it's almost like origami, the process of folding it. And can you show, you see on the edge, basically the, the notch there in, in the battery? Um, this guy? Yeah, so closer? so that, that's sort of like curve in, in the battery where they, they actually are not, so there's actually dead space. Can you point it at the, the corner there in the battery? Yeah, that, that there. So there's actually dead space there. Um, so there's this fascinating uh, you know, L-shaped origami thing that, that they fold in. Uh, in order to get the additional space. That that cutout there in the battery is actually totally wasted space inside the iPhone. And it's there for thermal expansion because they're concerned that if they if they filled in that space and they had it, it butting right up against it and you had thermal expansion, it could be a, a source of uh, compromise to the battery. It could cause a thermal runaway event and be a safety problem. And so Apple's uh, origami pattern is um, is designed uh, to be safe, but but fill in the L shape, but it's substantially harder to manufacture. Ooh, took out the little speaker girl with me. So there's just a piece of tape that's holding the Taptic engine and the speaker together, but here it is. I will probably pass it off to Kyle because he can do some nice comparisons. Um, I'll set that over here. And, and the thing one. with the speaker that came out a lot easier than the speaker on the 11. Yeah, way easier. And this year the uh, the speaker isn't like. There's a ton of adhesive and gunk that usually like holds the speaker on, so if you do need to replace the speaker, it should be a lot easier. And um, Kyle and I were remarking earlier that like this is so weird to find an orange piece inside. It's Every orange. Yeah, it's very strange. Can you can, hold up tell the me orange why piece? It's orange. Or can we see it there? Yeah, I. So we got the orange gasket. Look at that. I don't have any. I am just uh, baffled why it's orange. Uh, Apple likes to make everything in the phone look um, look so pristine and clean. Pristine. Uh, and, I mean, they go out of their way to have all the cables be unmarked and black. And they just, like, uh, Steve Jobs would talk about how uh, you know, his dad was a carpenter and the back of the cabinet was as important as the front of the cabinet. You wanted the whole thing to look, look good all the way through. And we see that where Samsung clearly does not care as much about what the internals look like inside their phone. They've got green boards. They've got mismatched colors. Um, They've got scuffing. Apple is polishing inner surfaces here in ways that are not completely necessary. So I would love to know why this gasket is orange. I think it's cool. It certainly calls uh, your attention to it. It looks really nice on this green, um, green iPhone. Um, but we, we definitely appreciate the gasket. It makes uh, repairing this thing a lot easier. In general, when you're waterproofing a device, gasket, you can glue it together and waterproof it, or you can use gaskets and waterproof it. Gaskets are always going to be a superior uh, for, for repair and, and remanufacturing. So I typically never, I mean, I usually, the, I usually just do battery replacements on iPhones. I don't do full disassemblies. So I believe that, is Taylor in the room? Taylor, uh, it's modular this year, right? So the SIM tray is modular and it wasn't in previous years? Uh, it was only modular in the iPhone 11. Okay. The SIM tray was modular in the 11, but, um, yeah. Uh, but now it's integrated, so we'll see. Yep, yep. We'll see what that means for, for serviceability. Generally, the SIM trays don't usually don't usually break, so I'm not super concerned about that, but it is. I got the camera shield off, and then I didn't pull off the camera, and I don't know why. That was the part I was going to do first. Let's get into the cameras. So um, uh, finishing up our conversation about the battery, uh, the... Um, the overall design of, of all of the 12 models really seem designed to cram 5G into the phone. And 5G is a significant cost increase. And so Apple was looking at how can we cut cost in, in this uh, device and also make room for um, make room for the 5G antennas. And I think on, on all of the 12 models except the Pro Max, part of how they, they cut cost was going with a rectangular battery. Uh, our cost, the batteries that we sell, the L-shaped batteries cost us about twice as much as as the rectangular batteries. So it's not surprising at all that that's an area. Apple shaved some cost off the battery, went unfortunately with smaller batteries than we would have preferred on, on all the 12 models except the Pro Max in exchange for paying Qualcomm a pound of flesh <laughs> for the 5G modem. Especially since last year we had like the dual connector battery and they did a lot of fancy things with their battery. I think that was the biggest surprise 
um, just going back to the rectangular battery. Uh, so here I wanted to talk really quickly about the cameras. Obviously the cameras are like the new cool whiz bang feature with the sensor shift. Um, and I think I'm going to pass this off to Taylor maybe to, uh, he's going to get the heat gun out and try to get us a closer look while I keep disassembling. Thank you. Thank so with you. the sensor shift, we've got two levels of, opt uh, of stabilization. You have the traditional optical stabilization that we're accustomed to where I can, I can touch the camera sensor and it's going to jiggle in here. Um, so that, uh, you know, that is a uh, passive mechanical element that is, is stabilizing the, the camera, which helps you when you're you know, moving around. The camera obviously needs to be stable to take a clean picture. Um, with, with this one, the actual sensor behind the lens, instead of the lens moving, where the lens has a lot of mass, the sensor is a lot lighter and it can, it can move faster in response to, to movement. So we'll see if we can pop this open and get a feel. We haven't seen one inside one of these. 12 Pro Max lenses, uh, and I'm, I'm excited uh, to get in there. This is, of course, you know, why would you get the 12 Pro Max rather than the, uh, the 12 Pro? Uh, the big reason is, is the uh, improved camera. So this is my least favorite part about repair, which is these adhesive strips. And I know adhesive strips are great, and they're a lot better because we're not gluing the battery down, and they should come right out. But I think my success rate on getting these out cleanly, I think I'm, I don't know what batting averages are, but it would be like, Two out of twenty-five. That would. <laughs> that's what it would be. Whatever. It's all about. Out. You know, you get a, a professional tech, and they're better at it. Sometimes you heat them up. It helps. Oh, um, I oftentimes cheat, and I have some adhesive remover next to me if I can't pull this out very quickly. But I'm gonna try with the tweezers. Uh, a lot of people say uh, get the tweezers out and wrap it around them, but it still takes me forever. Or wrap so. it around the spudger. Or if you have tips, drop it into the chat. People usually like to tell me how to do things. So yeah, I'd like the, to see uh, how you do it. These pull strips are just one of those things you really have to have a finesse for. We definitely appreciate them. We like we like having them over and above uh, the regular adhesive that you get in a phone like this, uh, but uh, they still are, are finicky. We actually, we we talked with the adhesive engineers at the manufacturers who actually make these strips, and, and we said, hey, what's your tip on opening it up? And they said, oh, we don't really know. We have problems with them, too. Wait, we, really? Yeah. And so we showed them our process. We're like, well, this is how we're doing it. This is how we're teaching people to do it. And they said, yeah, that seems as good as anything we've seen. Okay. Um, so it's not like we haven't tried. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is when you get an older phone, the adhesive gets a little bit more brittle. They seem less likely to break on a new phone. And once the phone's been around for a couple years, and uh, that's and usually it's when you do the battery replacement. So right. almost all the strips I've used... Uh, they've been really brittle and they break, so this phone's brand new. We just got it from the Apple Store, so we shouldn't have this many problems. But it's going. Tobias says you should use the opening pick to push those strips away. Tobias, why didn't you tell me that earlier? <laughs> so Tobias is coming to us from the future. Uh, Tobias is uh, one of our engineers at a Stuttgart, and he has been working on uh, these new phones for several hours. We're here in California, so we're eight hours behind Europe. Uh, so he got his hands on some of these things a little bit earlier. Normally, we would be in Australia right now, and our toilets would be flushing the other way. Uh, <laughs> but um, due to a global pandemic, uh, your teardown is being delivered a little bit later than usual. And uh, so Tobias has been helping us uh, at least remedy some of those time zone woes. Everyone's just saying go for the isopropyl alcohol. Do you guys want me to just go for the alcohol or keep struggling with these strips? I could also come and try one off. It also make Kyle struggle with these strips. So Jeff Neat wants to know, does it show any kind of error when you uh, replace the display? We'll find out. We've been part swapping on the, on the 12, uh, and we didn't have any troubles uh, swapping the display aside from loss of true tone as we're accustomed to. You do to. get an error when you swap the display down. Oh, you do get an error? What is it? It just says, uh, this is not a genuine Okay. So it says this is not a genuine Apple display, even if you're installing a genuine Apple display. Yeah. Uh, and Allow me to rant for a moment while KK works on the battery. Uh, so this is incredibly frustrating. If you take two brand new iPhone 12s and you swap the displays, it should not t tell you this is not a genuine Apple display. Of course it's a genuine Apple display. It just came off of an iPhone 12. What it's really saying is you uh, do not have the fancy software that o Apple only distributes to their Apple geniuses to swap the display uh, and then calibrate it the way that they calibrate it in the factory. And so you, they plug a laptop in, the laptop has a cryptographic signing key from Apple that, that says, hey, did you get it? Uh, no, I... You broke the first one? Yes. All right. And I put my tweezers, I wrapped it around, and now they're stuck together, which is pretty cute, so... 
uh, yeah. Glued together tweezers. Yeah, so it's this fancy uh, diagnostic tool that Apple has um, that they won't give to the rest of us. And that's, that's incredibly infuriating. I find it a little bit almost, I think it feels like they're infantilizing their customers. They're saying, you're good enough to give us money, uh, but you're not good enough to you know, uh, swap the screen on a device that you already paid us you know, over a thousand dollars for. This is, um, it, it's frustrating, it needs to change. Uh, hopefully uh, we will get a right to repair law passed. Uh, and if, if right to repair passes, Apple will have to make that, that diagnostic software available to the rest of us. Um, if you've been following along in the right to repair world, uh, last month, uh, well, last month, this election, last week. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like last month. Every, every week is a month yeah, in 2020. Really uh, last week, uh, we had a number of election results. The election result that I was most glued to, that I was most excited about, was question one in Massachusetts, which was, was an automotive right to repair initiative for wireless repair information that passed overwhelmingly 75% of people in uh, the great Bay State of Massachusetts voted in favor of uh, right to repair. It's fantastic. And what that means is that the next generation of cars, okay. you'll be able to access the information from the repair systems on your car wirelessly, maybe in a mobile app. Yeah. So. Um, major, major win for right to repair. Uh, now we need to get the right to repair our phones, just like we have for cars. How is the battery treatment? I'm now? cheating and I'm using adhesive remover. Okay. I, I don't know if it's cheating. It's just isopropyl alcohol. That's true. I just really wanted to get the strips. That, that's fine. Uh, while I do that, I'm going to start, going to let the adhesive remover do its thing and start working the logic board out. Okay. Okay, so we got a question. What is the easiest way to get the screen off? This is something that is really different with these phones. I think it's probably going to be the biggest adaptation that we have to make with the with the 12 compared to the 11 um, and, and previous iPhones. With previous phones, you, know, you do suction cup. We might apply a little bit of heat. You have a waterproofing you know, adhesive gasket around the edge of the phone. Um, but... Uh, you know, a good amount of, of heat and prying, then you can get an, an edge and then you can work around it with, with the guitar pick. And you didn't have to get very much uh, give because the glass is above the, the display and so we could, we could insert the, the pick into the edge between the aluminum uh, and the glass. Because the glass is recessed on the 12, it makes it more challenging. Um, and so what... Uh, we kind of have to go back to first principles with adhesive and say, what are the things that loosen adhesive? Well, the, the things that loosen adhesive are temperature and pressure. And so what we need to do to get the uh, adhesive loosened on, on the, the 12 Pro with its increased uh, you know, drop resistance, increased waterproof rating, uh, is we need to apply pressure and consistent heat all the way along. And then it, you, have to, you have to apply quite a bit of pressure over time. I, I've seen people pulling too hard and popping the suction cup off, you gotta basically apply the maximum pressure that you can with the suction cup for a period of time uh, and, and let that adhesive slowly pull loose. It doesn't pull loose as fast as the 11 and previous iPhones do. You have to, you have to apply consistent pressure over time. And so to make room for 5G this year, you'll see that there are these antennas all the way around the battery. And so we have less of kind of a well to wiggle with as in previous iPhones, so. Gotta be a little bit more careful, but let's see if it's, is it loosening? It's getting there. <laughs> I'm always pretty timid to use a lot of alcohol because I don't want to get it on other things, but. Yeah. All right, so we've got uh, an AASP, which is an Apple authorized service provider describing the Apple technique, and this is this is totally correct. And we have tried this technique. I don't find this any more effective than, oh, what, is than it? what KK has been trying, but it's, Use the black stick, which is a spudger. So use a spudger and use the pointy end uh, to roll the adhesive strips like spaghetti up, which is what KK was trying to do using the tweezers. She was yeah. rolling it onto the tweezers. Um, uh, we wiggle the adhesive to the left or right side, and that makes it a little bit easier. Perfectly reasonable. And it's really just one of those knacks where if you do this a lot, you, you get a lot better at it. Uh, yeah. And KK is not taking bar iPhones every day. And usually... I take them apart for friends or family or, you know, do battery placements, but we're all at home, so nobody has me doing this. And we're doing a lot of these teardowns remote, so a lot of the times uh, my engineers will let me, like, do some parts testing and take apart a few components, but I'm never usually doing the whole thing. And I don't have that practice either because we're all at home, but we're almost there. Taylor, how's it going with the uh, sensor? Pretty well. I'm nice. 
Taylor's getting his way into the iPhone camera sensor. Meanwhile, Yox King wants to know, in the U.S., do you guys have to implement right to repair in every state, or can we do all states at once? So a few ways we could do this. One approach would be to get Congress to pass a law. Unfortunately, the U.S. Congress is, is kind of uh, dysfunctional. Uh, we have the Democrats in charge of one branch. We have the Republicans in charge of another. And so getting something all the way through both branches of Congress is really challenging. Where at the U.S. state level, it's a lot more promising. Uh, and you can do a state ballot measure, which is what happened with auto right to repair, or the state legislatures can pass bills, which is how most laws get passed. And, uh, and that's what we're trying to do with right to repair. Over 20 different U.S. states so far in 2020 have introduced right to repair bills. Uh, honestly, we don't have to pass it in every state. If just a few states pass it, uh, very likely manufacturers will make that information available for everybody all over the place. In addition, it's not just in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, Europe passed some lightweight right to repair legislation for uh, refrigerators and other heating and cooling devices last year. And they're looking to do the same thing with smartphones. France is going to be starting to require repairability ratings. So, you know, here at iFixit, we love scoring everything from 1 to 10 on how easy or hard it is to fix. Well, France is rolling out repairability scoring system starting January 1st at any retailer in France. You'll be able to find out how easy or hard it is to fix your iPhone 12 Pro Max. You got it out. I got it out. It's out. That actually wasn't too bad. So, did, so did, 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 show us the back of it. Did you peel the adhesive off of it already? Uh, no, it's still on here, actually. Wow, so. look at that. So it, it just loosened it right up. Yeah, is this, anybody in the audience, are these different adhesive strips, or is this what they Those, always look like? I haven't worked on anything fast in eight. Same. It's the same. <laughs> so I'll grab those out now. Or you could leave them in. Yeah, I guess I could leave them in. I just, I really hate being sticky. Uh, I'm going to get one more shield off, and then I think I can get the board out. So I just got these in the mail. I'm super excited about this. This has nothing to do with the iPhone 12, but this is uh, Motherboard. Our friends over at Vice have a new physical zine, and so this is called The Mail. I think the cover is absolutely fantastic. And Lorenzo and Jason Kobler and all of our friends over at Motherboard have been working on it. Uh, the rise and fall of Leet Speak and how to hack ASCII and all kinds of hacker fashion manifestos. This thing is super cool. Very jazz. Thanks, Motherboard, for sending that over. I got the camera ready. Oh, yeah. We've got the camera open. Let's check that out. Um, can I flip it over there? Yeah, bring it on over here. And I'm, I'm really curious to see. I want to see how this sensor image stabilization works. Cool. Yeah, this is the first. The first. Uh, I, I don't think anybody Here. has cracked this open yet. So, we'll Hi, be going everyone. into detail on this Thanks, in our Eric. in our photo teardown. But you guys get the first glance at it. So, so this is the 12 Pro Max, the wide sensor. That's the the new one. And you can see this is like the module. And then you can open it up, and inside is the sensor. It's so big. It's really big. And then the this whole plate where the sensor wow. is moves around. And that's different from, this is one of the other cameras from the iPhone 12 Pro Max. Uh, and you can see on this one, the lens is what moves around. So that's optical image stabilization. And then this, like Kyle was, like Kyle was saying, this is sensor shift stabilization. So the sensor is actually the thing that's doing the moving around. And I would love to see the raw output from these and see what the different characteristics are. Because it's just, are you moving the front or are you moving the back? And it's obviously going to have big implications on the image. But I could not intuitively you, tell you off the top of my head without being an optical engineer what the what the difference is. If anybody has, has guesses, I mean, I, clearly you're, um, you're going to get sort of more fine control. You've got a larger surface moving. Um, uh, I, I, the sensor is so big. I originally I said that the mass of the sensor would be less than the mass of the lens, but now I don't know. Um, probably still yes, but uh, wow, that's a big change. So the logic board has, as you can see, it's connected through here. So it looks like there is a black sticker that is covering up all those antennas. So I'm going to peel that off, and then I'm expecting to find some more brackets, and I'll unscrew those and then I should be able to get the antennas off and finally free the board. So we're almost there. Wow. So people want to know what toolkit we're using here. Uh, we have a variety of tools, but the, the new tool that we're super jazzed to be showing off, Can I KK show it? has it. No, yeah, you can show it. Yet. So this is our brand new toolkit. We have not previously announced this. You are all getting this the is very like the, first 
This I is know. the first time yeah. this is being shown on camera. Wahaha. So this is the minnow and it's it's very small. Um, I absolutely love this and it has all of just like the most popular bits that you'd need. So the Y triple zero, which there's a ton of Y triple zero screws in here. Um, let's see. But we, we heard from people that absolutely loved our Mako kit, uh, but wanted something a little bit more portable that they could throw in a backpack or a pocket that they could kind of have with them on the road all the time. I wish they had something. And uh, cool. so we said, all right, let's let's make a, a kit that is you know sort of more travel friendly for the road warrior fixers. So this is the iPhone Pro Max for scale, and this is it's just absolutely adorable. I I want all small tool kits. A couple of years ago. We did an April Fool's joke where we made the Microtech Toolkit because you might Which is right here. behind you. Oh, yeah, it's, it's behind me, it's actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's show that. the Microtech Toolkit next to the minnow. This is the toolkit for mice. There it is. Uh, and so we actually recruited a hamster to be a part of a video, and he used the Microtech Toolkit to repair all of his hamster electronics. So the minnow might be a little big for a hamster, but it's going to be very small for the rest and of And somehow it. Kyle still keeps me around even though I do things like put hamsters in videos. So we will have more info for you on the new minnow kit, but we couldn't be more excited. We've been working hard on this thing all year. Uh, of course, we had to you know, be very careful with our bit selection. We weren't able to fit all 64 of the bits in, in the Mako, so we put the most important bits in the minnow kit. If you've uh, never taken apart an iPhone before, it just it's chock full of all these weird screws that you probably don't have a driver for. Every year it feels like we find a new screw type that we have to deal with. So I don't remember when they started putting the standoff bit in there. But that yeah, and what are you using for all these standoffs? Our standoff bits, um, which I actually didn't have because I had a really old version of our ProTech at my house. And I realized that I didn't have a standoff bit the other day. Uh, so if you're if you're buying a 12 Pro Max, you're probably doing it because of the camera. So what's what's the big difference with the camera and the 12 Pro Max? Well, you got the telephoto lens with the 4x optical zoom. It's a 2.2 aperture. Uh, if you're not a photo geek, and I have to explain what aperture is to you, you probably shouldn't be buying a 12 Pro Max. But what if I want to take low light photos of my cat? Yes, then you should know about aperture. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's actually, it's so funny that Apple doesn't reveal tech specs on anything else. Like they won't tell you the clock speed of the processor. They won't tell you how much RAM is in the phone, but they will tell you that it's a 2.2 aperture camera. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, the wide, uh, the wide lens is a 1.6 aperture. And, and that's where, you know, the big deal is on this 12 Pro Max is that sensor is so large uh, and you've got it there. Do you want to show that sensor again? Cause I'm just yeah, do continue you want to be blown away. To Cause this is always the big difference between like an SLR camera, uh, right? Your traditional pro cameras have huge lenses. That's what we're shooting this with and that is an SLR. And then, uh, I mean, this is yes. nowhere near even the, the sensor size of like a micro four thirds camera, but it's still off. very, very large for a, um, for a, for a phone. This is a substantial, wow, that's big. Yeah. I mean, again, I say big, it is big for a phone. I can't remember the specs. Is it 87% bigger or 47% bigger? I'm positive it is one of those numbers. Someone in the chat. But someone in the, the chat will probably number. know. Uh, so this this sensor is made by Sony. Uh, this is a major win for Sony. Sony also is moving big into time of flight camera uh, sensors, and I'm pretty sure Sony is making. I've got the the Samsung S20 here, and this has a time of flight depth sensor here, uh, and that time of flight depth sensor is um, is I'm sure made by Sony, and that's uh, measuring how long it takes. Uh, uh, I don't know if it, I, don't know, I would guess it's photons to go from uh, from the camera out and back. Uh, and so it's doing a depth map that way. The iPhone 12 Pro Max does it in a very different way. I should show off real quick the, uh, I have it here somewhere. Oh, here is the, the LiDAR from the 12. Uh, it's a piece of plastic, <laughs> not a LiDAR. You didn't pay enough money for a LiDAR if you just buy a regular uh, 12, but if you buy the 12 uh, Pro or the 12 Pro Max, you get a LiDAR. Um, and, and can you kind of point out where the LiDAR is at as we're pulling things yeah, out? It should be over here. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be there. Okay, so how does the LiDAR work? Well, this is um, using the same uh, uh, um, kind of technology that we have seen in, um, yeah, is, it, is it using the UV dot pattern the way that the previous ones? Yeah, the infrared light. Yeah, so, infrared light. so it's, a, it's a, is it, I mean, 
Is it really a LiDAR if it's infrared then? Well, yeah, it is. But. Uh, so the way that the infrared dot pattern work is you have the infrared projector and it projects a dot grid pattern on the world. Um, we uh, uh, we uh, did that with our cat, and with Michael's cat. And Not my cat, unfortunately. And then it calculates the, uh, the distance between the dots, and then it can create a depth map of the world, which is basically everything the camera sees, a dis you know, how, how far apart uh, each item is from each other. And then, of course, the number of dots uh, is the resolution of that depth map. Uh, this technology originally came from a little Israeli company called Invensense out of Israel. Uh, and Invensense powered the original Microsoft Kinect. Uh, so the connect for the Xbox where you could dance and, and play, you know, Dance Dance Revolution and it would uh, see what you were doing and it worked okay. The connect was never a runaway success because the sensor wasn't quite great and it was also kind of big and it would overheat. Um, with the, the, the follow-up connect, Microsoft actually had to use their own technology because Apple bought Invensense and took the technology and micro-sized it so that they could fit it into the iPhones. Um, There's so. literally just a sticker away from me pulling these antennas out. That's it. That's all I got. And then we should be good. And I can hop on the mini chair down with the rest of the team. Since we're talking about antennas, let's talk about the major new feature of the iPhone 12 series, which is 5G. Uh, are you excited about 5G? Not yet. Is anyone in the chat excited about 5G? I really am curious to know. The Vergecast like, said that our like US has like the slowest 5G. We of do all, all of, of the, the tests. Sasha over at PC Magazine did some some benchmarking drove all around the country, and found that, in general, 5G was slower than 4G. Uh, so, yeah, I am, I am really, really curious. Please, someone in the chat, if you are excited about 5G, speak up. Uh, because I'm not, and yep, I haven't talked to anybody. Connected. Are any of you guys excited about 5G? Everyone is shaking their head. Uh, and yet, in Apple's keynote, they talk about 5G, 5G, 5G. Everybody talking about 5G. Here's, here's my, my theory. Yeah, everybody says, nah. okay, Nosh says yes. Driven by Vlad says yes. Everyone else says no. <laughs> um, so here, here's my, my theory is that 5G is all about the carriers. Uh, one, they, they're being driven to where they have more, more, uh, more uh, frequency available. So they've got more spectrum on the 5G side. So there's kind of a cost factor to push them that way. But they also want to push people, they want to push everybody onto a $10 a month more expensive plan. Verizon's plan instead of $45 a month per line, $55 uh, per month per line if you want millimeter wave 5G. Uh, so this whole thing of all the uh, carriers or all the phone manufacturers moving is really being driven by the carriers. I don't think Apple really wanted to put 5G in this year's phone. Uh, I think that they were kind of forced to strong arm to. The, uh, they used uh, Qualcomm's X55, uh, which we're assuming the 12 Pro Max is the same X55 as the other iPhone 12s. We'll confirm that later. Um, the, the X55 is a 7 nanometer uh, manufacturing process. Um, uh, modem. It is not Qualcomm's newest 5G modem. That is the Snapdragon X60, which is manufactured, I assume, by TSMC on their five nanometer process. Um, which is, I mean, the the the, I, the A14 processor in these things is is being manufactured on that five nanometer process. Um, All right, I'm stuck on one bit, and it's right here. And so, and what's its problem? I don't know what its problem is. Oh, I'm not focusing very well. Anyways, it's uh, right above the sensor shield, and I'm using my standoff bit, and it's definitely a standoff screw, and it's not coming out. So, that's that. I will keep working on that. But after we get the board out, that was pretty much where I was going to stop, anyways. We've got this double layered board. Um, hey, Taylor, uh, could you maybe help me with this? The same as on previous uh, models, this double layered board. Uh, I mean, so this allows them to basically have you know four sides of a board instead of two in the same screw. space. They're mm -hmm. being, um, they are being uh, mm -hmm. very sort of yeah. uh, space efficient by going 3D and stacking stacking chips. So this gives them at least four chips mm -hmm. that they can stack mm -hmm. on top of each other without layering chips into something like a, a single package, like the SOC. Uh, the A14 SOC has lots and lots of things packed into Thank a single you. chip. Single How did package. you do it so quickly? <laughs> I've taken off like 10,000 of these today. Of course, my last one got a little bit stuck. All right, we got that off. Cool. Yeah, and we're good. Yeah. So can you walk us through kind of where all these 5G antennas are inside the phone? So they are around the right perimeter of the phone. So they go down this side. Um, Let's see here. We have a question. What's the difference between 5G millimeter wave versus normal 5G, and are they different antennas? They are different antennas. They are different frequencies. They are different bandwidths. 
uh, when when Snap, uh, when Qualcomm talks about the 5G modem RF, they call it a system. It's really a whole bunch of different frequencies. It's a whole bunch of technologies packed together. Millimeter wave is pretty substantially different from all other 5G. Um, and realistically, uh, you're not going to see millimeter wave 5G uh, unless you live in one of the biggest cities in the world for a very long time. Joanna Stern had to go to Dodgers Stadium to get That was one of my test. favorite videos. There's a fantastic video. Yeah. Uh, she set up her office in the center of Dodger State. But realistically, uh, nobody's going to baseball games right now. And, uh, I mean, all the tech reporters um, that I know have had to have basically a Verizon rep with them to take them to the exact spot, the exact portion of the street corner that Millimeter Wave is going to work on. So uh, the whole thing is a sham. It is crazy that we are spending as much money um, and the tech companies are spending as much time and energy putting Millimeter Wave into these things. They've really just been pushed by the carriers uh, because Verizon wants that extra 10 bucks a month from you. The board is out. Okay, there we go. There you go. So let's compare that board. So. You want to hand her, this is the uh, this is the 12 board. And let's compare the 12 Pro Max to the 12 board. All right. So, there, oh wow. Yeah, so this is obviously. So that doesn't have the cable integrated onto it, the antennas. Oh no, it does. does. I'm just, oh, it does, yeah. oh, okay. Um, yeah, so different So a little bit of board. a different shape. Same with the uh, Taptic engine. So they definitely squashed things down and they're different sizes. So it'll be interesting to see, I don't know, when we'll pull the shields off and we'll get a much better look in our step-by-step -step teardown. But just wanted to give you guys the first look at all the differences. So with that, I was only planning on getting to the boards. So uh, do you want to kind of talk, lay out all the components? Give us a little bit of a knoll of what's going on there? Uh, sure. Um, while you set that up, I'll uh, uh, finish ranting about 5G. Let's talk about cost. This thing, I mean, these phones are so expensive, and a huge amount of that cost uh, is going to Qualcomm. Apple wanted to build their own 5G modem. They bought the Intel unit that uh, made the modem for them, and uh, Intel didn't, uh, didn't deliver. The original plan was for an Intel modem. Intel didn't deliver, so Apple bought the division, and Apple is working on their own 5G modem, but it's not ready in time for these devices. And so... You know Apple doesn't like Qualcomm. Qualcomm powers all of their competitors' uh, Android phones, and Apple feels like in, uh, Qualcomm is totally ripping them off on licensing fees. We've seen this massive lawsuit between these two behemoths. You know if Apple had their choice, they wouldn't pay Qualcomm a single dime, and yet here they are handing over hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to Qualcomm for these 5G modems and their latest flagship phones. You know it really has to gall Apple where they talk about how we're a vertically, in vertically integrated company. We own all our technology uh, to then have to have the major flagship feature in their flagship 2020 phone um, be designed, built, manufactured, and profited by uh, Qualcomm. So I would be looking to the future, looking to Apple, jumping off the Qualcomm bandwagon <laughs> as fast as they possibly can. You know Johnny Struji is pushing his team of expert silicon engineers to build a 5G modem quickly. Uh, but in the meantime, here is your Qualcomm-powered X55-powered iPhone 12 Pro Max. Wow. And there it is. All right. That's it. That's all I got. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's our... The yeah, so uh, we're just getting started on, no, we're not just getting started. We are very in the middle of teardown season. So we are doing the iPhone 12 mini in the other room right now. Uh, like Kyle said earlier, our team in Germany got a head start on that. And then we'll be doing the iPhone 12 Pro Max this weekend. Please uh, give our content some eyeballs because the team has just been pulling all a ton of late nights. We did the Xbox earlier this week. We did the PS5. Yesterday? Wow, that was yesterday. And then there's an Apple event on Tuesday, so we will be seeing the MacBook Air, the Mac Mini, and the MacBook Pro with the Apple Silicon and the M1 chip. So lots going on. If you like this live stream, let us know. Uh, because we don't go to Australia, it's a fun way to give you guys a first look inside devices before, you know, launch day or on launch day. But that's all I got. Thanks for uh, bearing with me. Taylor, how'd I do? Did I do okay? Sweet. Cool. Well, thanks for joining me, Kyle. It's always nice to see you. It's Absolutely. been a while. This is a blast. Yeah. We'll all see right. you all next time. Bye, guys.